there are several other topics that we could cover at the intersection between extreme value theory and time series analysis. And if we have the time, we will be back towards the end of this course. For example, we could ask ourselves what happens when we drop the assumptions of a finite variance for what concerns the white noise, for what concerns the error term of our time series. Uh, in that situation, there are different possible uh, solutions. A very common one is to relax the assumption of a white noise with a finite variance by taking into consideration uh, innovations that are uh, distributed according to a symmetric, a first stable uh, distribution. And then obviously all the rest of the constructions of the ARMA process, for example, uh, needs to be adjusted accordingly, but we can still say quite some things when playing with uh, those type of time series. You can imagine that the more you make things realistic by making fat tails uh, enter your time series framework, the more uh, it becomes complicated to analyze the different uh, things. And there are specific models that are meant to take care of uh, those, uh, those problems. Again, we are not covering those here at this level, but if we have the time, we will be back. Another problem that I want to cover with you, which is more important for us at this stage, is the problem of heteroscedasticity. So what happens if the data we are considering are characterized by a variance, by a volatility that changes over time. Obviously, the basic setting we have been considering so far is no longer uh, valid, so we have to introduce something else. And this is the topic of the next part of our lesson. Until now, in playing with our data, with our financial data, possibly we have assumed the variance and so the volatility that for us at this stage is nothing more than the standard deviation uh, are constant over time. Now, in reality, this is not true. So it is well known that on the financial markets, uh, volatility changes and actually volatility is modeled. There are many indices, there are different quantities that take into consideration the changes in volatility. Uh, volatility is characterized by several uh, stylized facts. For example, we have the so-called volatility clustering in which on the market we assume clusters of volatility patterns, we, as, we observe periods of relatively small volatility and periods of relatively high volatility. And these periods are uh, justified by several type of events on the market, but most of all, they are linked to the common business cycle pattern that we know is present at the economic level. So we know that uh, markets follow and leave different phases and you see crises, you see in periods of boom and so on. This constitutes the so-called business cycle and volatility is highly influenced by business cycles. Moreover, volatility is very subject to the sentiment on the market. If for whatever reason that we do not cover, uh, there are specific expectations on the market and these expectations are not verified, are not fulfilled, then you typically observe uh, volatility changes in the market. Uh, if for whatever reason there is panic on the market, then volatility changes, volatility is uh, highly influenced by this type of behavior. So assuming the fact that volatility is constant over time is not at all realistic. Now, to play with volatility that changes over time, so to play with heteroscedasticity, there are different models that can be used. We will briefly consider Arch and Garch.
As we have observed already several times, price processes are almost never stationary. Remember, for example, that in financial mathematics we typically use processes like the geometric running motion to model prices. And what we know also from a theoretical point of view is that it is better to play with the returns because when we play with the returns, for example in the case of a geometric burn motion, but also empirically when we compute the returns related to a given stock, a given, a given asset, then those returns tend to be stationary or at least by taking the returns we are taking the differences so implicitly we are taking care of linear trends and mild uh, seasonality patterns okay now from now on with the quantity yt we indicate returns and these returns can be computed as percent return or log returns in practice under good market conditions, the differences between the two ways of computing the returns are uh, minimal. This is not true under periods of crisis, but we will be back to that when needed. An autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity model of order 1, or in short, arch 1, is defined via two equations as those that you can see on your screen. In these equations, we define important quantities. The first equation tells us that yt, that for us represents the asset returns, can be expressed as the product of two different components, sigma t and epsilon t. For what concerns epsilon t, we are taking epsilon t to be a white noise normally distributed with mean 0 and standard deviation 1. Remember that since epsilon t is a white noise, we have that the series of epsilons indexed by time are essentially an uncorrelated series of random variables. For what concerns sigma t, this is nothing more than the trivial square root of the quantity sigma t squared that we see defined in the second equation. In this second equation, we say that sigma t squared can be decomposed into the sum of a constant quantity, alpha 0, and uh, the squared returns of leg t minus 1. So, alpha 0 plus alpha 1, another parameter that we have to estimate and that is strictly positive, and y t minus 1 squared. So the squared returns of the previous time unit. Now, question for you. Why is alpha 1 uh, strictly positive? So why are we assuming alpha 1 to be strictly larger than 0? I will not give you the answer to this question because I want you to figure out why, but what I can tell you, a sort of hint, is just think about what we are discussing. So we are speaking about the variance. Given the arch1 construction, we can immediately derive important results that are extremely relevant from a theoretical point of view but also from an applied point of view, in particular the second one, because the second one is, if you want, and as we will see, the starting point of diagnostics for what concerns the presence of heteroscedasticity in our time series. The second equation is exactly what we will use in order to study the presence of something related to changes in the variance by taking, for example, the squares of the residuals of our time series fitting. To verify that yt given, yt minus 1, is normally distributed with mean 0 and variance equal to alpha 0 plus alpha 1 yt minus 1 squared, it's quite simple. Now, just write down our arch 1 model. From the first equation, we immediately obtain that yt is normally distributed with mean 0 and variance equal to sigma t squared. Using the second equation of the arch model, we know that sigma t squared is equal to alpha 0 plus alpha 1 yt minus 1 squared. And if we are at time t, 
the quantity yt minus 1 is known. So we can take that as a observed quantity. So it is trivial then to derive that yt given the value of yt minus 1 is nothing more than a normally distributed random variable of mean 0 and variance alpha 0 plus alpha 1 yt minus 1 squared. The second result is easily obtained by writing down the first equation for yt and then taking the square. So yt squared is equal to sigma squared t epsilon t squared. Now, we know that sigma t squared is equal to alpha 0 plus alpha 1 yt minus 1 squared. So we can rearrange the two equations now as follows. So we can rewrite the equation in yt squared. So yt squared equal to sigma t squared epsilon t squared. And for what concerns the equation in sigma t squared, we just write as you see on your screen so that we can now easily take the difference of the two equations to get another equation that combines them in which we have that yt squared minus alpha 0 minus alpha 1 yt minus 1 squared is equal to sigma t squared epsilon t squared minus sigma t squared. Now, this new equation can now be rearranged. First of all, we call the terms in sigma vt, and then we have that yt squared is equal to alpha 0 plus alpha 1 yt minus 1 squared plus vt. So, from our arch 1 model, we have derived an autoregressive model of order 1 for what concerns the square returns because yt squared is now equal to alpha 0 constant plus alpha 1 yt minus 1 squared plus vt, where vt is our error term, is a white noise. In particular, this vt term is a non-Gaussian white noise. And that means that our yt squared process is an autoregressive process of order 1 with non Gaussian noise. The distribution of vt can be derived explicitly, exploiting what we know about the epsilon t term. In particular, remember that vt is sigma squared t multiplying epsilon t squared minus 1, but we know that epsilon t is normally distributed, is a standard normal a random variable. So if I take epsilon t squared, this is a chi-square with one degree of freedom. And this chi-square with one degree of freedom has an expectation equal to the degrees of freedom. So since it's one degree of freedom, the expectation of epsilon t squared, it is just 1. So what is interesting is that now the quantity epsilon t squared minus 1 is nothing more than a shifted chi square of order 1. And in fact we have that the expectation of epsilon t squared minus 1 is equal to 0. The variance of the shifted chi-square is nothing more than 2 times the degrees of freedom, and for us this means that the variance of epsilon t squared minus 1 is equal to 2. This connection between an arch model and an autoregressive model of order 1 for what concerns the square returns will be essential for us. We will see that it's one of the tricks that we can use from a practical point of view to understand if there is heteroscedasticity in our data. And now an exercise for you. Given the arch 1 construction, try to verify these results for what concerns the moments of yt. So, for example, Verify that the expectation of yt is equal to 0 for all t. And the same for the variance for the fourth moment. And given the variance and the fourth moment, compute the kurtosis of yt and verify that this kurtosis is always larger than 3, if it can be computed, that is to say, when 3 alpha 1 squared is smaller than 1. And since the kurtosis is larger than 3, so it's larger than the kurtosis of a normal, we have that yt is a quantity that is lepto 
leptocortic. And since it is leptocortic, it means that the mass it assigns on tail events is more than the mass that a normally distributed random variable would assign to the same events. So, if you believe in the arch model, then it makes no sense to assume that your returns are normally distributed, which is a common mistake in many models in risk management. Now, the last question is also quite interesting because we have just said that we can define an associated process for the squared returns. This process is an autoregressive uh, model of order 1 and it is interesting to notice what happens to this uh, new process when 3 alpha 1 squared is larger than 1, so when the kurtosis of yt is not properly defined. Now, our model can be easily generalized by taking n legs in the y component, okay? So we can define the so-called arch n model and the estimation of this type of models is easily performed using maximum likelihood. Arch models can be considered a special type of a more general class of models for heteroscedasticity that we call GARCH, generalized arch. Now in a GARCH the idea, so the basic uh, difference is that we add an extra component that is an autoregressive part for what concerns sigma square itself. So we introduce an autoregressive element for sigma. Now, considering the number of legs in both y square and sigma square, we can have a Garch model with different uh, legs. But this is not particularly useful. In practice, we tend to consider a very simple Garch model, which is the Garch 1, 1, in which we just have one leg in the y component and one leg in the sigma component. The reason is that from a practical point of view, with a Garch 1, 1, you are able to model most of the situations that are of interest uh, for us. And taking into consideration more legs, if you want, becomes some sort of mathematical complication. What you see on your screen is an example of Garch 1, 1 in its different constituents in terms of behavior of the volatility part and assumptions for what concerns the parameters. In reality, a much more common representation is the one that you see now on your screen, in which the alpha zero component is better represented as gamma v capital L, where gamma is a parameter, and now we have that alpha plus beta plus gamma sum to one. Okay, so we are considering a convex linear combination of the different elements. And for what concerns VL, this is the so-called long run variance. So its value is a reference value for the variance to which our process uh, converges if there are no oscillation, if there are no idiosyncratic oscillations. So it's a sort of long run value to which we will tend to converge and with respect to which the present value is nothing more than some sort of uh, distortion, some sort of deviation. And to give a further representation, sometimes the quantity gamma VL is substituted by a quantity omega. So in the omega representation, the quantity omega represents the product of the parameter gamma, that together with alpha and beta sums to 1, and VL, which is our long-run variance. Now, imagine that we have estimated a GARCH 1, 1 model, okay, and the parameters that we have obtained for what concerns omega, alpha, and beta are those that you see on your screen. And let's assume that those parameters are significantly different from zero or the rest. We will see all the details later in our applied lesson. But for the moment, let's assume that these are our estimates and we trust these estimates. A first question that we can ask ourselves is what is the long run average volatility which is somehow uh, behind our model, which is implied by our model? 
So we know that omega is equal to 0 0.000002. And we also know that omega is equal to gamma times V capital L, which is our long run variance. So if we define uh, the ratio of omega over gamma, we can get a V capital L, and then we can just take the square root and we will have the long run average volatility. Now, since we know that gamma plus alpha plus beta are equal to 1. If we take 1 minus alpha minus beta that we have estimated, we will have gamma. So taking omega divided by the value of gamma, that is 0 0.02, we get that the long run variance is 0 0.0001. Now, we take the square root and we obtain that the long run average volatility is nothing more than 0.01 or 1%. This 1% is the long run volatility is the value towards which our volatility will converge if there are no oscillations due to different causes due to market movements. So it's a sort of reference value for our volatility. So let's assume that our GARCH11 model is correct and the parameters we have estimated are those that we have just considered. Now, a typical question is the following. Imagine that today the volatility is at a level 1.5% and we want to know what will be likely the volatility in 20 days from now. How can we solve such a question? How can we answer such a question? Assume that we are at time t and we want to make some forecast about n steps ahead for what concerns the expected variance and then from the variance we can get the volatility. Now the formula is very simple and is the one that you can get easily on your screen. So the expectation of sigma square t plus n is equal to the long run variance VL plus alpha plus beta everything to the power n multiplying sigma square t minus v capital L. Now computing the quantity empirically is extremely simple, it's just a matter of substituting the, the data of our problem and we get that the expected volatility in 20 days from now is 1.35 Notice that this value decreases from 1.5%, which is the value of the volatility today. And if you take n to be 60, 80, 100 instead of 20, you will see that the value will keep on decreasing. Why? Because our GACH11 model predicts that in the long run we will converge towards the long run volatility. The derivation of the uh, forecasting equation for what concerns the future expected behavior of the variance and so of the volatility is a simple uh, mathematical exercise and I leave that to you. So start from your GACH11 model and try to compute the expected value that we are looking for. As we shall see in the next part of our lesson, when we consider the R examples and applications, uh, there are tools that we can use in order to have some diagnostic of the presence of heteroscedasticity in the data and then to decide if we need to model volatility, for example, using our GARCH11 uh, model. Now, one of these uh, tools is extremely simple and it relies on one of the equations that we have just considered. For example, what we can usually do is to look at the residuals of our time series modeling, okay? So imagine that we are fitting a time series, we always want to end up with residuals that are white noise, okay? One thing that we can do is once we have fitted our time series and we have these residuals, we can square the residuals. So we can consider the squared residuals and we can try to understand if there is some dependence structure in those squared residuals. So we can apply an ACF, we can apply a PACF, and we can go on with the modeling, and if necessary, we can fit our GARCH model. As we shall see in our applications, the uh, estimation of 
Garch models is performed via maximum likelihood. Since in this course I want to teach you how to use tools in practice, I prefer to show you the different techniques using actual data, so using RStudio and trying to give an interpretation to our results. It goes without saying that if you want to enter into a much more theoretical modeling of time series and also for volatility, you can create very sophisticated models. And there are many beautiful models that from a mathematical and probabilistic point of view are completely uh, worth the study. The point is that, at least for what concerns my humble opinion, most of those models become almost useless in practice because of the many assumptions, because of the many little details that are very difficult to be verified or tested in reality. And that's why, for example, in finance, you typically stop with a Garch 1-1, which is, in most situations, more than sufficient to understand what is happening with uh, volatility. In principle, you could use a Garch model in which you consider instead of 1, 1, something like 10 and 27. So there is no limitation in the number of legs that you can take for the different components of the model. But mm, those uh, terms typically vanish quite quickly, so it makes no particular sense to, uh, as we could say, kill a mosquito with a tank. So it's more than sufficient to use our GACH 1.1 and probably it is more interesting for us to learn how to uh, give interpretations to the parameters.